Hey guys, we're down here in the workshop. I never really did a formal tour of this uh, this space. There's so many projects down here that I figure you guys would end up seeing the entire room anyways. Um, just on one side of the room, I see two RC airplanes that need to be finished and a remote control car that needs some repairs. So lots to do. The reason I'm here today is I finally decided on a preamp for my turntable. Uh, I've wanted to bring tubes into my setup for a while and figured the easiest and most cost-effective way of doing it would be to uh, to do a tube um, preamp for my turntable. So I'm going with the Tavish Design Vintage Phono Preamp and I'm going to use three Tung Sol reissued tubes. They're the six SL7 GTs for this preamp. The assembled version would run me about $700 US by the time I calculate the exchange and the taxes that's over a thousand dollars Canadian and since I'm the only one who uses the turntable that's a little bit uh, a little bit too much however uh, Tavish Design sells this uh, the bare circuit board uh, for this preamp uh, it's sixty five dollars and that's more within the uh, the budget now a little bit of background about this preamp. It takes both moving magnet and moving coil cartridges. The moving magnet signal path is entirely analog. There's no transistors at all. And the moving coil signal path, there are two JFET amplifiers right in the input. Um, but after that, it's entirely analog. For my purposes, uh, I'm going to be using it in moving magnet mode uh, while I do plan on upgrading the stylus. Uh, I have no plans on upgrading the cartridge, so I'll primarily be using it in moving magnet mode. So over the next few videos, I will assemble the board, take you through setting up the BIOS and testing everything. I'll keep track of all the costs and the time involved um, and see how much I can save over purchasing the assembled version. Uh, I think this is a really great option for people who are looking for uh, higher end audio at least I think this is going to be higher end audio, uh, at a reasonable cost. Now by assembling this preamp myself, I do anticipate that I'll be saving quite a bit of money. This is a great option for anybody who either can't afford it or doesn't see the value in spending, in my case, $1,000 on one component. Now a lot of people look at this as quite a daunting challenge, but really it's quite straightforward. Uh, the manual for this preamp is very well laid out. Um, it details every part and what supplier to purchase it from. You can get away with one order to DigiKey and one order to Mauser. You can get most of the parts from them. I only found a couple parts that were listed in the manual, but then when I went to purchase them, they had been discontinued by the supplier. But there's always replacements out there, and it's pretty easy. All you do is compare the specs. If the specs match the new part, you order the new part. I'm sure if you email Tavish Designs, they will specify which part they would recommend as a replacement part. So the key to successfully assembling projects like this are keep everything well organized, double check, triple check the components before you solder them in, um, and then as soon as you're done uh, soldering a set of components in, let's say you do all the resistors, Check all your connections. Make sure all your solder joints are, are making good connections uh, with the traces on the board. Now if you're going to attempt an assembly like this, a couple things you'll need. Uh, first one is a soldering iron. I use the Hakko. Really nice soldering iron, lightweight, uh, heats up really quickly. Very reliable. I have a few friends with these and they've had them for quite a number of years without any problems comes with a variety of tips, ultra fine uh, tips for service mount components and thicker tips um, obviously for thicker wire. As I said, heats up very fast, gets to really high temperatures. Retails for about $130, I'll leave a link in the description below. I highly recommend it. It's not necessary. For years I used a cheap 20 watt soldering iron from a local hardware store. Uh, it gets the job done, uh, and it works works very well. Um, from Antique Electronics Supply, we have tube sockets. These are ceramic. Very important to get ceramic tube sockets. The plastic ones are, are 
okay, but the heat from the tubes will eventually uh, cause them to crack. These ones will hopefully last indefinitely. Lid to the case. Tubes. Tongue saw. Six SL7 GTs. Gentle with those. And bottom part of the case. Next is obviously some solder. I have mine in a holder. Again, not necessary, just makes it easier to unspool. For this project, I'm going to be using the lead free solder. It's a tin copper mix. Um, it's nice. It does need higher temperatures uh, in order to make it flow and make good contact with the board. It's fine for the hackle. The hackle can reach the higher temperatures. Um, if you're using a, a 20 watt soldering iron, I recommend going with the standard 60-40 uh, lead tin mix that I have underneath. Uh, the 20 watt, little 20 watt soldering irons can't reach the higher temperatures and the lead tin just flows a lot better. Really, it's very, very easy to work with, uh, with the old school uh, leaded solder. If you're worried about the lead, just wear gloves uh, when you're when you're working with it. Uh, digi key, bunch of components. Uh, we'll unpack them as we need them. So a couple other things for this project that I'm going to be using that are nice but not necessary to have: uh, circuit board holder. Um, just makes things really easy. This clips right in. Flip it over, add components, flip it over, solder them up. Uh, the base is really heavy, makes it almost impossible to tip it over, knock it over when you're soldering. Um, so again, not necessary, something that's really nice to have. At the very least, you should have some sort of helping hand uh, device uh, just to hold the circuit board up uh, while, you're, while you're soldering. The next one is magnifying light. This one works really well. LEDs are quite bright and the glass lens is very, very clear. Again, I'll leave links in the description below for those products. And the last thing is a multimeter. Now I have the Fluke 87. I've had this one for years and years and years. Uh, originally bought it off eBay for, I think it was 80 bucks. Um, again, these are really easy, really nice to work with. Not necessary, you can go down to, again, your local hardware store, pick up a $20 meter. All we're gonna be using it for is checking some voltages and checking some uh, continuity between uh, your solder points uh, and the traces on the board. So a $20 meter will be more than sufficient. Everybody should have a multimeter, whether or not it's a, uh, a higher priced one or just a $20 one. They're incredibly useful to have around. So the last thing we're going to be using in this build is a USB oscilloscope. Again, not required, but uh, it's a nice thing to have. This one is just a low-end Picoscope. Retails for about $130. Uh, I used to have a big uh, old-school oscilloscope here, but it just took up way too much bench space. The nice thing about the Picoscope is we've got a built-in function generator and two channels. So basically, you put a 1 kilohertz sine wave on the input of the, the preamp and you watch the output signal. Again, it's not necessary. You could just as easily hook it up to a, uh, a receiver, put a record on, start at a low volume, slowly turn it up. If you hear music, you know everything's good with, uh, with your preamp. But it's nice to do uh, different frequencies and see the, uh, the response of the preamp. So the first thing we're gonna do while the board is empty, mark off the position of the standoffs and drill out the holes nothing fancy just mark them off i offset it a little bit just in case i need to put something else in this case it's probably not going to be anything but just so you have room along the sides Oops, forgot one
Here they are. This metal is pretty soft, so any standard drill will easily go through it. Once we have all our holes drilled, we pop in the standoffs. Always be careful of any metal filings that were created uh, while you were drilling. They are incredibly sharp. Just avoid them. Always want to be careful with the nylon standoffs. If you're using the metal ones, it's no big deal. But the nylon ones can be stripped out very easily. Um, so snug, but not overly tight. I will tighten these up later on in the project. Now we're just test fitting everything. See how it fits. So the next thing to do is to cut the holes in the cover uh, to allow the tubes to uh, stick up. That looks like it fits. Okay, so that's all we really need. The cover is completely interchangeable. It's symmetric, so it doesn't matter which side we measure from. Um, and it lines up to the back quite easily. So all we really have to do is measure to the first hole there. Nine millimeters. So that was challenging. The uh, stepper bit was really burning through batteries on my cordless drill. So went out and to the garage and used the AC powered uh, drill and got through. Still going to go through with a Dremel, uh, use a, a small grinder, make sure all the sharp edges are gone. Uh, always remember that the burrs on aluminum can be really sharp, so you always got to be careful. And while I was out there, Drill the hole for the on-off switch. It's not the one that Tavish Designs has in their in their manual. It's just one I had lying around. Uh, it'll do four amps, so more than enough for uh, for this preamp. Okay, I think that's it for today. So next time we'll start soldering components on the board. All right, see you then.